welcome to Edison Open House Space 2022. Now in this session, we're going to focus on the work of Exos Aerospace. It's a developer and operator of reusable space vehicles. And with me is their CEO and founder, John Quinn. John, hello. Hello, Vivian. Great to be with you this morning. And I have to ask you, what is that behind you? So uh, about a year ago, our rockets evolved uh, through a contract with the US Air Force, and that is a hypersonic reusable launch vehicle. Uh, those four words normally aren't together, but uh, that, that's in the background in the shop here. Fantastic, aren't you all glad I asked? So <laughs> just let's have a bit of background on Exos uh, Aerospace. Tell me a bit about how it was founded and what it's done so far. So um, it was an opportunity, right? In 2014, Exos Aerospace brought the Armadillo Aerospace team that dated back to the year 2000 out of what they called hibernation mode to develop commercial space vehicles. And uh, Armadillo Aerospace had a really rich history of rapidly building prototypes of rocket powered vehicles with a small team. They built hundreds of rocket engines, all different fuels and dozens of flying vehicles. Um, so the team was mostly volunteer and they won the Ansari X Prize Lunar Lander Challenge. And as you know now, Lunar Landers, everybody's after it for the uh, NASA contracts. And in, second, in the second uh, round of competitions, they lost to this little company you might, might know about, Lockheed Martin. Ever heard that? Oh, that name one, before? that one. <laughs> you know, this little team of 10. Um, so very impressive. But they're, my favorite project that I saw when I met this team was the Rocket Racer. And they had taken, in just a matter of a couple of months, and built two complete propulsion systems and put them on some canard aircraft for Len Fox and Dave Morris to fly in a Tulsa air show. And they had a simple requirement. Because the airframes couldn't withstand the rocket engine being on constantly, they wanted to see it start one thousand times before they got in that aircraft. So they successfully did that, starting a rocket engine a thousand times. And even today, um, you know, you hear NASA just was successful at taking the space shuttle engines and getting 10 runs out of them, right? So a thousand times is pretty impressive. Um, I brought a friend of mine in, the guy who taught me how to trade stocks. He's the one who helped me to figure out how to fire my boss and go off and do uh, bigger ventures. And uh, he flashed back immediately to grade school, watching Apollo 13 on the floor of his teacher's um, house in the living room on a black and white TV, watching Apollo 13 go up. So uh, he joined me and Exos Aerospace was born. So you've come from a place in space history where billions almost of, of dollars were spent on something which just blew up basically. And now you have uh, e equipment that can be used uh, multiple uh, times. Tell me about the advantages of, of your particular system, because there are a number of other people in this, in this area now, aren't there? Yeah, while there are literally 100 companies reaching for space right now, um, we have a few key things. One, we're one of 10 companies right now that actually have a launch license. And I'll guarantee many of those 100 companies have a much better business plan than we do but they may not have the 20 years and just the operational tempo of going out and testing a rocket on a weekly basis or going to launch uh, every few months. Those are the things that are really gonna make reusability uh, in the future. And we're, we're not inventing anything really new. We're just combining things in a different way. So we're taking key NASA technologies um, and leveraging those for ourselves, um, if you look at air launch, I think it's a phenomenal capability uh, that eliminates so many of the problems. You know, we have to grow responsibly um, from the environment, but even air traffic. You know, if you look at the flights today that are taking off, 
uh, on the coasts in the US, it interrupts air traffic, right? And we've come accustomed to being able to go where we wanna go. So we're focused on air launch. However, as I look at that model, and I talk to people in the industry, you know, Northrop Grumman has done it, Virgin Orbit has done it. And I believe they're somewhat limited because they have a dedicated aircraft for launch. And if you're flying every day, that works. But if you're flying, you know, a couple times a month or you do a campaign every quarter or something like that, the financial burden of that is restrictive. So our approach is we're using commercial cargo carriers to launch our aircraft. So if I want to launch from Alcantara in Brazil, well, they just happen to have cargo that's flying into Brazil. They're only 30 minute flight from us to come pick up our rocket, go launch it, and then go right back into commercial service. And I believe those are the types of things that we've done for many years that will make the dream reality, bring the cost down and allow us to operate this as a viable commercial business. Now, tell me a bit more about your flight heritage and where you are in the development of your launch vehicles now. Yeah, so we started with our Sarge suborbital reusable launch vehicle. And I love to give the analogy, you know, when you go to the store, you don't throw your keys in the trash can on the way into the store, right? Because you can't afford to replace a car, yet rockets that are so much more expensive, we throw the keys away. We say, okay, we're done with them. So we've got to get beyond that. But the predecessor to the rocket behind me actually flew four times, placing us amongst the giants in the industry. I mean, SpaceX, Blue Origin, and back in the 1960s, uh, Northrop were the three companies that have actually flown a reusable rocket more than, or period, flown a reusable rocket. So uh, we evolved that vehicle to the one that's behind me, as I said, with a US Air Force contract for a hypersonic reusable launch vehicle. Uh, I don't know that those four words have ever been combined before Exos Aerospace, um, but we went from the vehicle you see behind me was designed a year ago, built, integrated, and tested, and we actually hovered it uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So in under a year, we're able to go from design to a full, completely operational uh, flight vehicle. So, and we did that with a team of six, okay? So I like to say we do with millions what they do with billions, <laughs> and that's kind of our heritage. And obviously this leads us to our next step, which is commercial orbital uh, and a much larger vehicle and uh, pretty exciting times where we're going through our series A round. We commenced that about a year ago. And I'm hoping to be able to uh, make the announcement on that final closing on that round very soon. And give me some indication of the difference in costs between the old, you know, vast, great, huge billion dollar and what you're doing now. Yeah. So, I mean, for suborbital today, you know, if you called us and said, hey, you know, six months from now, we want to launch on your rocket and we've got a hundred kilogram payload it would be $6,000 a kilogram for orbital or for suborbital. And we're targeting to be at that $12,000 a kilogram payload range for orbital. But there's a difference. And of course, Virgin Orbit has it and Northrop Grumman has it today. It's one thing to jump on SpaceX and get a $2,000 a kilogram payload cost to orbit. It's a totally different thing to say in six months, I'm gonna, I wanna be there. And you'll all of a sudden find out, oh, it's a $6 million flight on Blue Origin. The costs have gone up dramatically. And you still have to travel to get to where you want your satellite to be. With air launch, you put it there and within days you're on orbit, you're operational, uh, you reduce the risk of traveling across space with tons of space junk risk. Um, but it really, uh, Vivian, much like your background with the 100,000 Genomes Project, which amazes me, we have a bigger mission. It's great to put satellites up, but that doesn't change the world. Your project has the potential to change the way medicine is done, right? So 
my real vision is following after the thousands of brilliant scientists who have had successful experiments on the International Space Station. Dr. Abba Zubair put stem cells on the International Space Station, had huge growth of the stem cells, had activation, something we can't do on Earth. And that was successfully proven for regenerative type medicine, whether it's uh, spinal injuries that you can't medically treat, but oh, stem cells can restore zones of control in your spine. Um, or as my dad has suffered a stroke, uh, Mayo Clinic did some clinical trials with a hundred uh, people. And we happen to actually know one of those people who was bound to his home, who's now out traveling the world because he was given a second chance on life. So we do that by putting up a micro space lab. Um, I had a vice president friend in the biomed industry and she told me, I don't need a space lab. I don't need the ISS. I need 50 flights to space in the next year to figure out how to do the science and how to do the manufacturing of our biomedical compounds in space. She said, we know what we can do in microgravity because it's almost like working inside your body, but we don't know how to do it. So give me a flight every week. That's why we still have a suborbital program. And then I'll tell you that I need this particular payload to go up for two weeks, three weeks, six weeks, then bring it back to me. And she said, we'll change the world. Regenerative medicine will be born and we'll make crystals for biomed that we could have never imagined on earth. Now, John, that's the big vision, but I'm going to bring you back to the kind of the cold hard money bits. Uh, what are the key future developments that are going to drive future revenue growth? Yeah, so um, commercial air launch, orbital vehicle. And when I say air launched, it's not single stage to orbit, but the aircraft is stage zero. The rocket will go the rest of the way to space. So brings the complexity way down, obviously brings the cost way down. And that's 2025 targets. And then 2030 target would to be have that space lab up there, have all the research done with the biomedical companies and the fiber optic and the chip manufacturers, where we show them what we can do in space. We've developed the technology on those inexpensive flights. And we're not putting more space junk up that uh, doesn't change the world. A final question. I'm going to take you to 2030. What are your key operational targets for the company and your ambitions for 2030? Just very briefly. Yeah. So uh, enabling for the betterment of mankind through a on-demand space lab with a short-term call-up uh, that'll enable brilliant minds to unlock the opportunity that only space access can provide. So in, in a few words, a micro ISS that we can put up and bring back on demand. Fantastic. It's been such a pleasure talking to you, John Quinn. Thank you so much, Vivian. <laughs> Wonderful meeting you and speaking with you today.